Welcome to another episode of the Learning to Choose podcast, episode number six with Eric Rogel. I am your host, arts advocate, community builder, creative entrepreneur, and author behind Learning to Choose, Evan Snow. This new podcast series was created with the goal to discuss the stories behind pivotal choices, learning lessons, and takeaways from interesting individuals coming from various backgrounds and walks of life who have lived extraordinary lives. For more information on Learning to Choose and our author and host, log on to learningtochoose.com. Our guest today is Eric Rogel. Eric Rogel is a best-selling author, popular podcast host, and even more popular podcast guest, documentary filmmaker, globetrotting journalist, and highly sought after and renowned speaker whose presence, personality, and approachability have captivated audiences around the country. Eric is the first person I've met to have a wild bio. Uh, and during his journey, Eric is proud to say he has amassed a wildly unique, wild resume. Here are just a few highlights. Eric spent two days on Easter Island hiking the volcano and walking around the Moai. He rode shotgun in one of the first fully autonomous vehicles and spent two hours driven by a computer around the streets of Tokyo. Eric has kayaked the crystal clear waters around Bora Bora, Morea, and Fakarva Islands collecting black pearls. He passed the stock car racing license certification and has driven some of the most noted tracks in the country. He learned how to pour the perfect pint for Maury Guinness, great, 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 great grandson of Arthur Guinness at St. James Gate in Dublin, Ireland. Eric was a competitive martial artist until a kick to the head made him realize getting kicked in the head for a living isn't a wise career choice. He spent part of the Wacken Open Open air heavy metal festival in Germany suspended 150 feet above the crowd doing shots of Jaeger, which is another long story. And while these may not be described as business experiences, Eric brings something from each of these adventures into all of his talks and workshops. And we'll tell you how you'll be able to hear Eric locally in our community here in Broward County coming up at Creative Zen in just a few weeks. But without much further ado, Eric, why don't you kind of take us back a little bit and give us some context as to some of the early choices that you made to kind of get you started on this crazy journey here in life. Yeah, thanks, Evan. It's a pleasure to be here. Really, really appreciate the uh, the invitation and hearing some of those things that I've done. You know, if you knew me when I was young, when I was a kid, you would call BS on all of that. Because for me, you know, and, and my story's pretty much out there. It's it's in my new book. But, you know, I, I always say this when I'm a guest on podcasts is, you know, I was raised uh, to be soft. I was raised by a single mother and she raised me in what I call a culture of fear. There's really only two ways to raise someone right now. It's either in a culture of fear or in a culture of courage. And this has gone on for millennia. And I was raised in a culture of fear. I was raised to be afraid of everything. And as I got older, Evan, when I started getting into my teens, I realized this doesn't feel right. You know, there's a part of me that wants to uh, strike out. There's a part of me that wants to take some risks. There's a part of me that wants to get kicked in the head and see what it's all about rather than, you know, sitting quietly inside with a book, reading or coloring or doing any of those things that I was uh, doing when I was, when I was young and the, and the decision for me, and it really was, um, a tough decision, number one, but it was the right decision looking back on it. When I left high school and went away to college, what I decided and what I chose was to take risks. Let's, you know, mom had always raised me not to get bumped or bruised. I always joke that she raised me like a veal. I had to be very soft and tender, not get bumped or bruised. But I wanted to know what it felt like to get bumped or bruised. I want to know what it felt like to uh, get hit or, or hit someone or take a risk or have that adrenaline flow. So the very first thing I did, I went away to school about two and a half hours north of where I grew up in New York. Um, my very first night 
in college, there was a poster on the wall for a martial arts club. Now, I, this is something that I wanted to do my whole life. When I was a kid, I used to watch Kung Fu theater and I used to mimic all the moves. And there was a local guy in New York who would advertise on TV that he had a judo school. And my mom was like, you are never doing that. So there was kind of this push pull with me of mom never wanting me to do it and me really wanting to do it. So the very first choice that I made when I got to college, which turned everything around, was to join this martial arts club. And I went and guys were hitting each other and kicking each other and throwing each other to the ground and rolling around. And Evan, I got to tell you, man, I never felt more exhilarated, more alive, more natural. And when I was in there getting kicked, I'd broken many bones, bloody noses, stitches, whatever it was. That was the beginning for me that really said to me, this is what life's about. This is where you experience stuff. Get out there, get outside the comfort zone, go do something. You're going to get bumped and bruised. Great. But you're going to come back with an amazing experience that you can talk about forever. So really, I mean, that was the very first choice that I made that changed everything. It took me off that path of comfort and softness and fear and put me into that area of pushing against the comfort zone, trying new things, being a risk taker, taking the bumps and bruises, what I call our big, beautiful battle scars that benefit us so much uh, in our lives. So, so that was probably the first one for me. Amen. And uh, well put, some of, the, some of those battle scars end up shaping us uh, in ways we don't realize until later. And um, I, while I didn't do uh, martial arts and karate, I, I'd certainly have my fair share of battle scars um, that you just made me remember. For those that uh, are curious, as I am curious, I saw you went to SUNY Albany, but where did you grow up uh, in New York? Yeah, I did. I went to Albany, um, which was great. It was a great four years there. I learned a ton of things. I would say more outside the classroom than inside the classroom. It was a great cultural thing for me to be on my own, to get out of the house. And I think, you know, for me, it was also fairly safe because it was about two and a half hours north of where I grew up. I grew up right outside New York City in Westchester County in a town called Eastchester, which was right next to Scarsdale, Nourishell, um, you know, about you know a few miles north of the Bronx. Yonkers was right there. So that's, that's the area where I grew up. Nice. Okay. And uh, you've definitely lived a... <laughs> quite an interesting life. So from those early kicks in the head mm. uh, and those early battle scars and SUNY <laughs> experience, uh, what what type of choices did you then make, you know, post-college and uh, how did that, that windy road path start to unfold in front of you? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it was a windy path. Trust me. I mean, it was a really windy path. And, and looking back on it now, and it might seem like it was all over the place. And I've had a few people say to me, like, they'll look at my overall resume or my background. They're like, is, you know, how many lifetimes have you lived? You have like 10 careers that you've been through. And some people have kind of looked down on that and said it's all over the place. But to me, and in the work that I do, we say everything you've done in your life has led you to this moment where you are right now. So for me, Amen. everything that I've done, and when you hear this in a second, you know, led me to where I am now. but. The original choice that I made was I wanted to be a chef. I love food. Uh, I was working in, you know, restaurants and, and, you know, little small places when I was growing up. And I got to Albany that first year and I really didn't like it at all. I think part of it had to do is it was my first time away and on my own. And there was some fear there, but I really was still loving food and I wanted to be a chef. And I told my dad that I was going to uh, drop out of Albany and go to chef school. Like I wanted to try for CIA or one of the big, you know, training grounds for great chefs. And my dad said, well, why don't we get you into a program you can do before you leave school and make such a big decision without really experiencing like, you know, an upscale restaurant. So my dad uh, had a big job at Bloomingdale's. He pulled some strings and got me a job at the, the Bloomingdale's and White Plains uh, while I was 
on breaks from schools. And I was the kitchen fly. I did everything in the kitchen. So anybody that was off for the day, I took their job. So I learned grill station, sandwich station, salad station, prep station, everything. And I loved that. It was awesome. And one day they came to me and they said, well, we need you out on the floor. We need you to wait tables. And I said, no, I don't wait tables. I'm a chef. This is what I'm going to do. I want to learn everything I can inside here. And they said, well, no, we basically, uh, you know, you're the kitchen fly. Your job's to fill in wherever we need you. This is where we need you. And so I relented. They sent me down to the men's department and I got a pair of, I don't know, black pants and a white shirt, whatever they had me wear for that, that day. And I got to go out in the dining room. And I had a blast out there, Evan. It was just amazing. It was like, wow. Um, I'm working less. I didn't go home smelling like grease. I had cash in my pocket. I got to hang out with people all day and, you know, chat with the people, you know, the customers and, and be outside. And what ended up happening from that is I stayed with Bloomingdale's while I was all four years of college. And when I graduated, they said, hey, we would like to offer you a position down in Manhattan working in our flagship store. We have five restaurants there. We'd like to put you in the, uh, our executive training program and have you run these five restaurants. And it was awesome. I didn't have to go, you know, shop my resume around and go on endless interviews as a college graduate. I had this job. And so I ended up working in Manhattan for Bloomingdale's and it was an absolutely amazing, amazing experience. And I, and I learned a ton and I was running the restaurants, not as a chef, but I still had the food background. So that served me really really well. And, and I learned a lot at Bloomingdale's about just marketing and presentation and um, dealing with customers in the right way and all of those things. And plus, you know, like I said, I was a young guy working in, in one of the best cities in the world. And so it was an amazing decision for me to, to say yes to that and, and take that job and, and go down to the city. Amen. Everything happens for a reason. And, uh, I try not to listen to those people that question, uh, you know, why didn't, why didn't you just stick to one job and one thing like the book says to do. And I tell people, you know, now like, well, what book is that? Like, don't they update these books? And yeah. I'm very big on, you know, Gary V and, and entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, you can write your own book, you can craft your own path. And, uh, I'm certainly glad that you, that you did that. And then, serendipitously uh from those experiences you you know somehow found your way into the creative world advertising marketing graphic design yeah. uh could you tell us a little bit about some of the choices then from transitioning from you know the chef world and and bloomingdale's to yeah. uh, uh to uh to getting to become creative even more creative than you were initially <laughs> Yeah. And, and that, that it's a, I'll, I'll tell the story real quick, but, um, I was working for Bloomingdale's. I, I came down to South Florida for a wedding and I swore I would never live here. I had grandparents that lived here. And when I was a kid, I hated coming down to Miami. Um, my, my grandparents lived, uh, right off of Ives Dairy road, you know, right at the time it was unincorporated Miami Dade or North Miami or whatever it was now part of Aventura. And, and I didn't like coming down there, but I came down as a 24 year old man for this wedding. And actually, you know, I had family that were still down here. They took me to South beach, which was just starting to get going. This is in 1990, just starting to get going. And I was like, wow, this is really exciting. And they took me to this restaurant. It was one of the top restaurants in the country at the time. They just won the James Beard award. They were top five restaurant. It was called Mark's place. And Mark's was right on St. Sushi Boulevard in Miami. And they were doing absolutely amazing things with food. And I, I got a job there. Um, I wanted a, um, you know, like a, a management position. But they didn't have that. They had a waiter's position. And I took it. And I worked there for two years. And I learned even more about food and amazing things about wine. And, you know, celebrities and athletes and all these famous people were coming in. And it was just a really fun place to work. But you know, I wanted to move on and I was making a, a choice to, to not be in the restaurant business anymore. And I will tell you, um, a friend of mine who was actually interning at Mark's at the time, who's gone on to build some absolutely spectacular restaurants uh, in Dade and, and Broward, 
um, Tim Petrillo, for those of you that, that know Tim and his restaurants, uh, the restaurant people is his company. Tim was awesome. And, and he was interning there. And, and, and even at that time, he was just a genius when it came to restaurants. And he could see my frustration. And he asked me what was going on. And I said, you know, I just don't want to be here. And he said, Eric, you know what? The restaurant business is black or white. You either love it or you hate it. And the minute you start to not like it, you've got to get out because you're not serving anybody. Um, you know, you're, you're, you've got to be, you've got to, that, that enjoyment, that love for the business comes across. And if you don't have that and, and you're actually the opposite, you're doing yourself a disservice. So the choice was, I'm going to do something else. And I thought about law. I was going to go to law school. And I took the LSATs. I scored really high in the LSATs. And I got recruited by all these law schools. And I, uh, Evan, I, I couldn't bring myself to fill out the application. I just <laughs> did not in my heart want to be an attorney. I had friends that were lawyers who really you know, weren't enjoying themselves. I'll put it that way. Um, and I was telling my father about it. And he said, you know what? It's too bad you never did anything with your art. You were always really creative. You love to draw. Uh, there was one point where I wanted to be an architect, uh, but there was too much engineering and math involved in architecture for me. Um, and I said, you know what, Dad? I'm 24. It's not too late. And I, I ended up going uh, to a school in Miami that was, at the time, it was called International College of Art and Design. Or Inter wow. yeah, International something of art. And International Fine Art. Yeah. International Fine Arts College. There you go, Evan. Yeah, you remember it. I couldn't remember it. International Fine Arts, because it was IFAC. And I'm like, what does IFAC stand for? International Fine Arts. What, what year was this? This was probably 91. Okay, keep going. Okay. <laughs> so I went there, did really, really well. And um, um, I actually won most of the art competitions they had. And I won uh, the Freshman Art Show that year. And they were offering me a scholarship for the next year. I loved it. I was doing graphic design at the time. They were calling it communication design. Photoshop had just come out. Like people were just starting to learn how to use Photoshop. And we had started the semester doing paste up, like cutting out print things and putting them through wax and pasting them down and really old school stuff. And I just loved it. I was still working at the restaurant um, while I was going to school. And one of our regular customers, um, he was, uh, he ran one of the largest mail order companies in the country. And he offered me a job. He asked me one night when I was working in the restaurant, can you do this? Could you design that? Could you draw this? Could you put this together? And I said, sure. And he made me head of product development for the mail order company. And I had a blast. I worked there for a few years and um, did really well. And I was doing great designs. We were designing product and went to all the product shows around the country, uh, learned a great deal doing that, and then decided I wanted to get out of that. And it was around 98, 99, and the internet was coming. So I wanted to learn how to do websites. So that's what I did. So I learned to design websites and do that. And I had my own company that was called Grasshopper Entertainment. And we were doing online educational storytelling for kids. And we were Evan, we were ahead of our time. We wanted to do things you couldn't do yet. Like Flash was the only animation thing at that time. And you couldn't really <laughs> get Flash to do the stuff we wanted to do. And um, and then we started uh, getting hired by other companies to create content for them. So I had a team of graphic designers, illustrators, artists, cartoonists. We did some really spectacular stuff until 2000 when the dot bomb hit. We all our clients went out of business. And so I was, you know, uh, married at the time. I had a young stepdaughter and I didn't know what to do. And a headhunter called me and said, look, I got a job for you. And it was with an entertainment company. And I went and it was the art director there and worked for them for a while. And then they had a magazine, a trade magazine. Now, around this time, I started teaching at Broward College. Uh, I started teaching at the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. And... um they had a magazine and they said, do you know anything about print? And I said, yeah, of course I do. We want you to see this magazine that we've got. Went in, looked at what they were doing, hired in some of my students who I thought were exceptional in to help put this magazine together. We turned it around and the guy who owned the magazine said, you should do this. I have a couple friends that want magazines. You should do this. So I ended up spinning out and started a company and we were an independent we were a, like a publishing house for independent publishers. 
So if you wanted a magazine, I had artists and layout guys and a printer and nationwide distribution channels and a sales team and editors and writers. We'd put the whole magazine together for you. So um, some of my clients were Lady of America Fitness Centers. Hooters Restaurants was one of my clients. We built their magazine for them. I had a couple of photographers out in California who wanted, you know, like a vanity magazine that showcased their, their stuff. And we did great. And we were rolling along until 2008 hit and the recession came. <laughs> and then Ugh. all of my clients didn't want to spend money on vanity magazines and, and marketers were pulling all of their stuff back. So another setback. But what had happened at this time was for one of the magazines, I think it was Hooters magazine. They needed content. And my editor had asked me to look at some of the content and help her edit it. She's female. And she said, you have a man's perspective. What can you do? So I went in and I, I edited some stuff for her. And she said, Eric, you need to be writing some articles. And I said, I'm not a writer. I'm a, I'm a designer. I make things look pretty. That's what I do for a living. I do the layout. I make it look nice. I do the covers, all of it. And she said, no, I want you to write some articles. So I came up with this column that was called The Bachelor Guy. Ask The Bachelor Guy. So I did it anonymously. And this thing became really popular. And I didn't know, but my web designer had created like a blog page for this, started putting up my articles there and submitting them to a news aggregate site called Dig. I don't know if you remember Dig back in the day. It was like really popular. And our servers kept crashing because we were getting 30, 40, 50,000 people coming through this thing. And from there, PR companies start calling my office because our office number was in the masthead of all these magazines. And they're like, Eric, we want to, we want to send the bachelor guy on this trip. We want the bachelor guy to come on this press tour. We want the bachelor guy to do this thing. I'm like, guys, I'm the frigging bachelor guy. It's me. I'm not going anywhere. I got to be here in the office running this stuff. And it was amazing. You know how that I kind of, I tell everybody, Evan, that I fell backwards into all of these things that I did, but in, in truth be told, I was, there was a part of me that was making very, very conscious decisions on what I was doing and where I was going. Because again, like I said, all of it has led me here. And so I made the decision, all right, I'll travel around as the bachelor guy. And it came down to GM. General Motors invited me on what they call a full line drive. They're like, we like to fly you up to Michigan and let you drive all of our cars and then write about them. And I thought they were kidding. I'm like, guys, look, I'm just this thing. I'm, I'm not doing, I was, you know, kind of minimizing myself going back to my old days of playing it soft. And fortunately for me, um, the head of communications at the time was a guy named Chris Barger, Christopher Barger. And he was absolutely amazing. And he said, Eric, you don't understand. We want you to come up and write about this stuff. And so I did. And that got me on every press list for every press trip. And so a lot of those things that were on my wild bio were a, were a result of me going on that first press tour and, and actually becoming legitimately a, a men's lifestyle journalist. I wrote about cars. I wrote about spirits and food. I wrote about adventure travel. I wrote about gear and gadgets. I wrote about relationships. All of that stuff that led me down this path. And actually a, a, a publisher came calling and said, hey, we love your stuff. We have an idea for a book. And they laid it out for me. They said, we want to title it The Art of War for Dating. And it was taking Sun Tzu's The Art of War, the 13 chapters, and turning him into a dating guy for men. And they said, we've read your stuff. We want you to do it. And I had to do like a little audition. And I wrote that. And it did really, really well. It hit like number two on Barnes & Noble's list for um, um, dating and relationships or whatever their list was called at the time. Uh, got some great play on it um, to like, you know, and, and it, that led me down other paths. Then Discovery Channel came calling and they said, we've read your stuff. We're putting together an online presence at discovery.com. We want more content along adventure travel and cars and all these things. And I ended up going to work for them for a while. And all of this kind of led me to the path where I said, this is all fun and I'm having a great time and I'm writing about all this stuff but it was my own personal journey. And I'd come back from some of these trips and, and buddies of mine would say, Hey man, where were you this time? What did you do? I'm like, well, I was hanging over Wacken open air, heavy metal festival in Wacken, Germany, 
doing shots of Jaeger with a bunch of people suspended over this thing at this crazy um, like sky bar that they had attached to a crane. Oh man, I wish I could do that. I would love to do that. And I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of us out there that want to get out of our comfort zones that want to do this. And I started, you know, training with a mentor and a group of people and some trainers uh, in an organization down here called Self-Discovery Life Mastery. And it put me on a path of self-discovery, we'll just say, who I really am, what I'm really doing, becoming aware of, you know, things that, that were holding me back. And I fell in love with it and it drove me forward. And so part of what I do now, Evan, is I'm paying it forward to my mentor and to his mentors who mentored him in getting me on the path of more of a culture of courage, more of a culture of moving myself forward. And so I have committed myself to helping other men do the same. And so now looking back at all those choices and all those things that I did that seem so disjointed, you know learning to cook, learning about food, learning about, you know, marketing, getting involved in product development, getting, you know, traveling all over the world as a journalist, meeting people, interviewing people, having a podcast of my own, writing books has really led me to where I am now, where I can fortunately be a mentor to other men, still being mentored myself, still on my own path. But I've chosen, you know, a career now of, helping leaders lead and writing books and creating whatever it is, be it, um, you know, visual form in documentaries or whether it be written form in books and posts uh, and, and hosting adventure masterminds, I call them for men to get them out in nature, challenging themselves, pushing themselves. We did one this weekend and we've got guys who are still talking about the impact that it's had on their lives, just pushing past some of their, you know, getting out of their comfort zone, tapping into courage and really, you know, giving that all to themselves. And, you know, in my work, we have what we call the four foundational archetypes. It's the warrior, the lover, the king, the hero. These guys tapped into warrior uh, and, you know, on new levels, they were embracing the heart side and learning to trust other men that were in the group with them, building those bonds of brotherhood, sharing their wisdom with each other, which all comes from the heart. To me, that's living as a king. You've, you've integrated your warrior and your lover. And we have what we call our sacred seven core values. And they're courage, honesty, integrity, commitment, duty, honor, love. And if you notice, Evan, courage is number one, and it's number one for a reason. Because you've got to have the courage to move yourself forward. When you have the courage to be ruthlessly honest with yourself, and honest is, honesty is the second one. You have that courage to be ruthlessly honest with yourself. Then you can make those choices that you need to make. And a lot of them, Evan, are tough, hard choices. Um, but when you, again, when you have that courage to be ruthlessly honest, you can make those choices. So that's kind of what led me down this path. And, and that's where I am now. There's a lot to unpack there. I have so many questions. <laughs> and Good, it seems them. like we are very kindred spirits in many different ways um let me try to go back from the beginning uh coincidentally our last guest on the podcast was a professor at the international fine arts college and he happened to have been my business partner's college professor did you and i think he got there in 1991 uh, did you have lawrence gartell as a professor by any chance no, name's not ringing a bell. If you knew no. what he taught, it might, it might, um, it might ring a bell. But he no. ended up teaching a little bit of graphic design. That's another story for another day. Um, <laughs> and then, did you did you mention that Tim Petrillo gave yeah. you advice mm -hmm. on your decision to either stay or leave the culinary world? Yeah, yeah. Tim was he was fantastic, man. I, I you know, Tim is when it comes to that. Uh, world, that culinary world, you know, he's, he's so fantastic. He's just a genius, but he really did. He was, it was so funny because he was an intern at the time. He was still going to college and he was working with us part-time, but even then he had the, um, the wisdom and I never forgot that. And, and I'll tell you what, it, it runs in a lot of things that I do where he says, you either love it or you hate it. And when you start to hate it, it's time to go because you're not serving any yourself or anyone else. 
And so, yeah, I, I took that advice and it had served me well. And that, that was uh, just actually trying to put the, the timeline together here. So that was at, did you say it was Mark's restaurant? Mark's place. Yeah. Mark's place. Mark's, place. A, Mark's Militello. Mark Militello was the chef, um, the executive chef there. And it was on San Sushi Boulevard in Miami. Wow. And uh, so this was, I take it, he was still going to school. Just a quick side note, context transition. Uh, this was before he went to go work for what I believe, if I recall correctly, was uh, either Houston's or uh, some initial restaurant experience. Yes. And then this was before, obviously, the restaurant people, TRP, YOLO, yeah. and now. Yeah, yeah Tim yeah. was, he had just gotten the position at, at Houston's. As I was leaving, wow. as I was leaving the restaurant, Tim had just gotten the position at Houston's, which was major because so, they only selected a very select few people for that. And for those of you that don't know, Tim Petrillo, I'd love to have him on the podcast one day. I mean, he's one of the most uh, accomplished and successful restaurateurs in Fort Lauderdale, Barron County, one of the uh, founders and partners behind the restaurant people that owns Yolo S3, Boatyard. Uh, and now he's developing hotels in Miami with PMG and Eleven. Um, and coincidentally, one of the other reasons why this is serendipitous and why we're kindred spirits and why there's so many dots connecting here. Eric and I met when <laughs> I used to host the Choose 954 Local Artist Discovery Series every Wednesday night at YOLO for three years running up until covid um, where we would bring a different local artist to live paint outside. And uh, Tim coincidentally owns that and, and made that opportunity possible. And we should probably revisit that to bring it back now that COVID's in the rearview mirror. But um, very small world. And then uh, I would love to get a little bit more into the men's work side of things. Uh, men's work has had a profound impact on my life. I'm in a, a uh, weekly meeting conscious men's group under arc of brotherhood. Um, and I would just love, and I'm now becoming an advocate for men's work and self care, and mental health. And, you know, a lot of things that are not just important to, to me and men and, and women and people that are doing the work, but really should be important to anybody, kids, the next generations, elderly, everybody could benefit from doing some work. So uh, how, well, A, how do you like to describe, you know, the men's work that you do? And then B, um, I guess just uh, any of those choices or learning lessons or takeaways that you've garnered from your experience um, w in the men's work. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And, and I'm glad to hear that you're, you know, you're doing something. We have a weekly meeting also. Um, it's a Zoom that we do for men that are all over the country. It's called the Bold Men Brotherhood. And that is all about men being the best men that they can be. And, you know, Evan, one of the things that, that really became apparent to me and that I became aware of when I was doing the work with self-discovery is, you know, mentoring is so important. It's critical. Yes. It's crucial. And we've yes. kind of lost this, you know, and, and it was one of the things that I, I discovered was, you know, I didn't really have strong male role models growing up. And it was when I got to, to college and I was meeting, you know, I had martial arts instructors and then got out of college and met people in the working world and then really got into this work and met some really amazing, amazing men that I, I owe my life to, that I made the decision, made the choice, if we're going to use the words, you know, from the podcast, Please. Uh, you know, made the choice that this is what I really am um, called to do. This is my purpose. This is what I'm here for. Because I, I've, I've grown up both sides. You know, I, I was raised in, and the title of my book is Lions Raised as Lambs. And, and the whole book is really about leadership and mentoring and being mentored by, as a man, being mentored by good men. And, you know, this is my way of paying it forward to these men that have come before me, men that were raised in a culture of courage or live in a culture of courage and could take me from that culture of fear or wanting to be soft or being in the comfort zone and pushing out into courage. And so for me, it was really, I felt both sides. I am here. This is my purpose to lead from wisdom, right? Wisdom being experience, not read it in a book, not, you know, heard about it in a video or whatever it is. I lived it and I live it every day. And I make that commitment 
to myself to be in integrity and live it every day. And, you know, working with men who are raised the way that I was or men that want to be the best men that they can be. The only way to do that is with other good men, men who are ahead of you on the path. And for a lot of men, it's really difficult to do that, to say, well, I'm going to go follow this guy because we're, you know, we want to be independent. We want to be our own alpha to throw a word that I'm not a fan of, but we'll use it. You know, I want to be the alpha in my life and I want to this and I'm the guy, but you know, you don't know what you don't know. So having other really good men who have been through it is invaluable. It's critical. It's crucial. So that's really what this is all about in the work that I do is how do we make this accessible for all men? So I have the Bold Men Brotherhood calls that we do. Uh, we do them Thursday nights at 6 p.m. Anyone's invited to, to, to try those out. If you want to talk to me about it, reach out. We do those. And I have a, a thing we call the Bold Men Adventures, and I call them Adventure Masterminds because we get guys out into nature, which is where we need to be anyway, Evan. So listen, if there's one thing I can tell the listeners, get out into nature as much as possible. Fortunately, you know, you and I, we live in South Florida. We can get outside year round, but get outside. And we take these men outside and and get them doing things in nature, whether it's whitewater rafting or rock climbing or mountain biking. Uh, We did um, a challenge course outside this past Saturday, just a couple of days ago. And like I said, those men were profoundly impacted, conquering fear, pushing past things they thought they couldn't do. And we're just exhilarated at the end of it. So I offer that too, because getting out and getting active is so, so critically important. So in looking at those couple of things that I do, and then obviously the books and and everything else, and I do one-on-one with men. I do mastermind groups with men. Um, I've done it in corporations to go into companies with men and women and look at how important mentorship and leadership are. Um, Leading to create kings and queens around you is essential. That elevates you to hero. So it really has become, you know, Evan, if you've done any of this kind of work, you know how um, how incredible it makes you feel, the impact it has on your own life. But I call it generational impact because these men who are now taking this on, having the courage to step into their warrior, embrace their lover, live as kings, and then create kings and queens around them so they elevate to hero, those young kings and queens that they've helped on the path will then turn around and do the same. And then they will turn around and do the same. And so we are truly not just here for the men and women, depending on what work you're doing, but those that are here with us now and impacting them, but then the ripple effect and the generational impact that it makes going down the line is just, it's untold. And it's just, um, it's beautiful and it's brilliant. And it's something that gets me out of bed every morning and drives me. Amen. Very well put, my friend. Uh, I share the same sentiment. And the previous podcast guest before Gartel, uh, my buddy Ernesto Madowski, we, uh, you know, really started to share and open up and and really actually kind of challenge or, or encourage listeners to seek out mentorship or even to be mindful of who you might want as a potential mentor and then maybe even just asking that because you're right it it, it's something that maybe our culture has gotten away from you know everybody's super busy um i'm forever grateful for the men that uh took an interest in me and saw something in me that i did not see in myself Mm -hmm. Uh, my mentor and friend juan who invited me to my first uh, monthly breakfast lecture series talk that gave me my aha moment that led me to hosting this thing. Now, you know, seven years later, where you're going to be the guest uh, coming up this month in October um, to many other men in between. I'm forever grateful for their contributions to my life. And uh, you know, now I try to pay it back and pay it forward when I can as well. And I give you a lot of credit and kudos for how you summed it up. Also just so grateful to hear somebody like yourself that's, you know, really has been around, been there, done that, and still so humble and grounded and balanced. And 
that's something too that uh it's that's not a given and i've come to find especially um you know people that have had some success that have made some money that have done some things you know that's not something that's taught in school uh similarly to mentorship is is how to remain grounded and balanced um and thankfully as a, a result of all this work that you've done between self discovery between the men's work between writing between you know the creative fields um it really has uh contributed to a life that i admire that i mean i'm just sitting here listening blown away by uh, our synergies and 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 kindred spiritness and you definitely seem like somebody that um i'm striving you know as a, at my young 37 years to aspire to be like uh as i continue to progress in in my life and uh i would just now venture to ask you um how all of those life experiences uh has led to this most recent book here uh, that you just released in 2023 and what a potentially interested reader or somebody that's, you know, interested in doing the work or somebody that loves, you know, self-discovery and personal development and, and transformation, what they could potentially expect to find, um, in, uh, in, in lions raises lambs. Yeah. Thanks. Evan. And, I, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, this is very much my story and I say that in the book, this is my story. But it's also your story because so many of us, and I hear from men all the time, have very similar experiences. So I wrote this with my mentor, Rob James, uh, who founded Self Discovery. And, you know, he's been doing this 30 some odd years. And he and I were raised very differently. Like I said, I was raised in a culture of fear. He was raised in a culture of courage. He was raised on cattle ranch. And then he went to the Marines. So he's very different life experience. In this book, it is really about the journey, and it's told in an allegory. So it's told as an actual lion raised by sheep, by a lamb, and how he feels it's not right, and there's something you know more to who he is, and he is discovered by this mentor, and this mentor lion, great warrior lion, mentors him in the ways of how to be a lion. And it takes you through this journey of dropping the fear, dropping the softness, tapping more into the warrior that you are, the lion that you are, and becoming, you know, uh, embracing the lover side. So, you know, we want to be well balanced. So we've got to have that other side too. And, and the young lion in this uh, book goes through all of this, meets his true love, discovers his true passion. Um, and his purpose in life as a lion and a king. And he is mentored by this great warrior lion, and he becomes his own king, his own lion, his own man, so to speak. And it is the journey that I've gone through. And it's the journey that so many of us, if we haven't gone through it, we desire to go through it. And the book will help guide you there. So you will learn, you know, like we, we, we call it the, uh, the three pillars. And that is the four foundational archetypes that we just talked about, how to tap into your warrior more, get that beast going, get that warrior tapped into so you can drive yourself forward. The lover archetype, which is our heart side. You discover that heart side because this is all the stuff that makes life so juicy and delicious, Evan. This is the stuff that I resisted when I got into this work because I felt uh, it was going to make me weak and soft again. But that lover side of us is wisdom and generosity and trust and inspiration and creativity and playfulness. And again, all those things that make life so wonderful. And embracing both of those, you get into the king. And that's the journey this lion takes that we all take to find those sides of us and then in, 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 um, integrate them into our king. And then of course, elevating the hero by creating kings and queens around us, leading them, mentoring them, not from um, being selfish, but from purpose, right? From purpose. So those are the four foundational archetypes. And then obviously the sacred seven that I spoke about, courage, honesty, integrity, commitment, duty, honor, and love, and how to live from each of those in your own life. 
And finally, you know, the golden rule. We, I love the golden rule. And I always say, lead and mentor as you would be led and mentor the best one that you can be. Be that mentor you wish you had when you were growing up and push that, um, all that wisdom out into the world to the people that are there. That's what this book is about. And it's about making that decision, making that choice, Evan, that is so important that says, hey, I'm a good man. I want to be the best man that I can be. And I know to do that, I need to reach out to other men that are out there that may be ahead of the path on me in certain areas so that I can really take their wisdom in and gain so much from it. Or I want to be a better father. So I want to read this and understand how to guide a young son into being the best man that he can be and be an example for my daughter. And be an example and a role model of what she should look for in a in a man, um, and that that's really what the book is about, Evan. So it really is my journey. It's everyone's journey. Uh, the the feedback that we've gotten on the book has been extraordinary. It's it's you know Rob and I had an intention when we sat down to put this together that it would impact men and 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 certain other things that it would have, um, you know motivate men to, to move forward and hearing some of the feedback and reading some of the reviews. It's not just the kind of stuff that says, Oh, this was a great book. And I enjoyed reading it. It was, this is how I'm going to live my life. This is how I'm going to raise my sons. This is invaluable in me in guiding them forward. This is how I'm going to lead my teams. And so it's, it's really been, uh, you know, in the couple of weeks, the book has been out. Uh, just really heartening for me to hear that. And it gets me motivated and, and wanting to move forward. Well, I am very motivated and <laughs> very looking forward. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's very true for, for men on, on any step of the journey and, and any level of the path. Uh, if you're new to men's work, if you want to consider men's work, if you've already done men's work, um, I could, I could already tell, how inspirational, motivational, life-changing um, this could be for anyone. And uh, you you triggered me to, um, I'm looking at the book here on Amazon, and I looked under the bestsellers in the men's gender studies category that you list the book in. Mm-hmm. And there's one book, there's two books at the top. One of the books, the men in my men's group, swear by and I've read multiple times. I haven't read it yet, but it is on my list. And the other book that uh, is atop this list that a lot of people have heard of are Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Mm. And you are definitely in very good company there with both of those books. <laughs> hey, um, yeah, we, like I said, we've and, been blown away Evan, by, by the response to it. I mean, we we hit number one in four categories right out of the gate and number three in two others. And that, that one you're talking about there, we were number three. Um, so yeah, it was, it was number one in fatherhood, num- number one in, um, parenting morals and responsibilities. Um, and, uh, uh I think the number three also in father son relationship building. I mean, fantastic. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. Oh no, hundred percent. Well-deserved. Uh, I'm very excited to share this podcast, uh, and the book with my men's group. Uh, we had, done our own mini retreat where we just got an Airbnb on the other side of the state in Naples and did a lot of exercises. And the one that kind of came through that you triggered some very fond memories of uh, when you mentioned, you know, King elevating the hero is our, Mm -hmm. our King's chair uh, exercise that I outlined in my book. And that was one of the most uh, powerful, impactful exercises that I've ever participated in, um, in the men's work, which is one of the most impactful groups and, uh, tools in my tool belt that, you know, I yearn for and look forward to as part of my, uh, ongoing personal development work and self-care and just absolutely my favorite brotherhood of, of men that are not my family that I could tell I love them to, um, has just been such a powerful thing and everything that you've mentioned um, really, really hits close to home for me. And I'm sure a lot of men too, like I mentioned, if you're on the path or not, if you're doing the work or not, if you want to make a change in your life, or if you didn't even know that you wanted 
are needed to make a change in your life. There are people out there, you know, there are the Simon Sinek's, there are the Gary V's and there, you know, there are the Jocko Willings and there are the David Goggins and, and I love and respect and have learned so much from all of them. But there also are local people in our community, fortunately, uh, that are doing the work and are making resources and knowledge and connection and mentorship and so many things available. And I'm so grateful that we connected so many years ago. Uh, we, we added each other on Facebook. I told you then, you know, uh, that we had just started this monthly breakfast lecture series, mini Ted talk that I knew from our initial interaction at YOLO that I would love to have you share your story on. And then, you know, lo and behold, five years later, uh, you'll be sharing, uh, at our next creative Zen event, which is our, if you're not familiar, it's a monthly breakfast lecture series. It's a, min, a mini TED talk that we host for free every second Friday morning of the month uh, at the Cotilla Gallery inside the Alvin Sherman Library on the campus of Nova Southeastern University in Davie, Florida and Broward County. And uh, it's local people sharing their thought provoking, relatable, inspiring story as it served as my aha moment in January 2016. When I was just a regular Johnny 9 to 5 recruiter sitting at a desk, listening to some TED Talks, wondering, you know, what more I could do in life. Um, so I have chose to continue to pay it back and pay it forward by continuing to host these events for free and bringing in my coach, mentor, friend, teacher, Chloe Ravel, uh, a.k.a. the Gemini Rising, to lead a guided breathwork meditation exercise to help us get in a Zen state, hence putting the Zen in creative Zen. And uh, there's a, you know, a free breakfast and coffee and obviously opportunity to mix and mingle and quote unquote network with other community members. So many beautiful things have come out of this. So many beautiful friendships, collaborations, events, speaking opportunities. It's a free event. You can find it on Eventbrite. You can find it on Facebook um, under Creative Zen presents Eric Rogel, and uh, we would obviously welcome anybody in South Florida to attend on the morning of Friday, October the 13th. Uh, if they would like to connect with you first, let's go with in person. Uh, do you have any other events coming up on the calendar that you would want to or, or would be able to invite uh, a potential listener to? Yeah, that's great. And I appreciate that. And, and I, you know, we just did the one event on Saturday. We're going to do that one again, upcoming either uh, later in October or in early November, because it was so well received and so popular. So if, if guys want to go to Bold Men Adventures with an S, you can see some of the stuff we've done in the past and you will get, you know, you can jump on a list there and get notified when we have our next uh, either trips or one day events. Um, so it's bold men adventures.com go there first, uh, that, and then you'll get to know, you know, wh where we're going to be in person. Love it. Uh, and if they'd like to connect, I guess, virtually, uh, mm -hmm. a, you know, what's the best way, email, social media, uh, website. And then if you would like to, uh, maybe direct them to how they could join that Thursday night call at six o'clock. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So yeah, connect with me on, on social media, any of them. Um, I'm Eric Rogel on all of them. I'm the only Eric Rogel on Facebook. I'm the only Eric Rogel on LinkedIn. I'm the only Eric Rogel on Instagram. Just reach out, be bold. I always tell the guys I like bold and I like courageous. So reach out to me, take that step, make the choice, choose to get to me. And you will find me there. So it's E-R-I-C-R-O-G-E-L-L -L -L on any of the socials. And you can also go to lionsraisedaslambs.com. Get info on the book. Get info on me. Uh, there's a place there, too, where you can jump on my list and get notified of everything. But I love to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. So just get a hold of me. Get on there. And we'll talk about the, um, the brotherhood, the Bold Men Brotherhood calls. I like to talk to guys before they jump in as a guest. So reach out, get to me. I will give you all the information on how to meet a group of really amazing men who are doing everything they can to drive each other forward. Amazing. I 
I uh, I do have my my weekly Wednesday uh, men's group, but I certainly am am open to and, and interested in exploring and, and uh, learning more and even seeing maybe how uh, my men's group and some other men's groups that I've now uh, gotten in contact with, maybe how we could collaborate together on, on a, one of the adventures or, uh, you know, some other synergies that we can maybe explore uh, on a one-on-one or having lunch after Creative Zen. Um, I, I, I will be respectful of your time and, and work to wrap up here shortly. But um, before we do that, any learning lessons, recommendations, books, podcasts, best practices, or other choices and things that have uh, you've already mentioned so much, but that uh, you generally like to share to help other men and women and people uh, who you know are on their path and journey in life? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, um, I'm glad you said men and women because look, I, I work with men but it has an impact on the women in their lives. So, you know, when men step into their king, I always tell them the women in their lives can relax into their divine queen. So it actually benefits uh, every part of your life to get involved in this, not just you yourself, not just, you know, being selfish or however it is. It it really does help in all areas. So I would say do that uh, if you can get into the work. Um, in, in terms of books, yeah, Lions Raises Lambs is a great one. <laughs> so jump into that. I have some favorites of my own that, that have led me. I mean, um, Iron John by Robert Bly is an excellent book and really talks about uh, the impact on men. Uh, another one of my favorites, and it, it's been required reading in some of the things that we've done, is The Warrior Ethos by Stephen Pressman. Talks a lot about um, stepping into your warrior archetype. Um, it's a great one. So I would say those, but I would also highly, highly, highly recommend this. I always tell men it's great to read books and watch talks and videos and all of that, but nothing beats experience. So whatever it is you're doing, whatever you're reading, and I and listen, I'm a writer and I enjoy books, but experience is so much greater. So get out there and experience. Go on these adventure masterminds that I do. Go on some of the stuff that Evan's talking about. Look and see where you can take yourself out of your comfort zone. Go out into the the woods, into the mountains for a couple of days. Do some solo camping, which I've done and it's had profound impact. But I would say experience is the biggest. So go do that. One life to live. You're not promised tomorrow. I waited till I was 32 years old to leave the country for the first time. Wow. I am a hopeful romantic, and I thought <laughs> I was waiting for future Mrs. Snow, who still hasn't arrived yet, but that's okay, to <laughs> go on this trip uh, you know, out of the country. And lo and behold, uh, if you're born Jewish, you're entitled to a free trip to Israel through a program called Birthright. That was made possible with donations from some very generous people. And um, it used to previously be for uh, kids, I believe, initially up to 18. Then they made it up to 21. Then they made it up to 25. And then lo and behold, I was 32 years old. Thought I missed the opportunity. My uncle told me it wasn't safe to go when I was younger because the bus bombings and all those things that thankfully they got passed. Uh and then I get an email that they made a trip for 32 year olds at 32 year yeah 32 year olds and I was 32 and going on that trip absolutely changed my life absolutely changed the way that I viewed travel um absolutely viewed the way that I uh viewed uh group travel and uh having like a tour guide going on a retreat um experiencing different cultures uh, and all the things that if you are familiar with the birthright program that you fortunately get to learn, go into Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel and so many things. And, and you've alluded to this. I've alluded to it and it could never get tired saying this. Beautiful things happen outside of your comfort zone. The best things happen outside your comfort zone. And I would not be sitting here. I would not be hosting this podcast. I would not have just wrote my book 
if I did not make a series of choices outside of my comfort zone to listen to TED Talks, to go to Wynwood for the first and second time in 2014 when I had no idea what this place was and was not into art at all, if I didn't choose to go to this monthly breakfast lecture series and get an aha moment, if I didn't choose to go explore uh, food, and actually I started as a food blogger, another synergy we have in common. If I didn't choose, fortunately, to be present when the opportunity met for me to connect with my future business partner and didn't choose our first venture to do a art fair inside of mansions off Las Olas that people only got to on a boat. And if I didn't choose psilocybin mushrooms, and if I didn't choose getting into yoga during COVID, and if I didn't choose a, a men's work, which is thankfully the, the last learning lesson that I mentioned in the book, you know, I could have sat at that desk being a Johnny nine to five recruiter for the rest of my life. And there's nothing wrong with being a Johnny nine to five recruiter or sitting at a desk. Somebody's got to do it. But fortunately, uh, there was a path that was destined for myself and for yourself and that path and that destiny um, and being, you know, a king and elevating to a hero. Those things lie outside of your comfort zone. And I have heard a lot of people speak. I've read a lot of books and I have not heard many people summarize it and have it resonate with me humbly, uh, generously, transparently, the way that you just summarized it here on this podcast. And I am very grateful for that. And I really, I really do. I feel called as well to connect, engage and motivate and inspire people, which is why I do the community building work that I do and do a lot of things for free, me and my business partner. And um, I'm just so grateful to have somebody like yourself in the community who uh, who did agree. And to the point, this is a, a great testament and example of what he mentioned, you know, that I reached out and asked you to speak at this thing. And, you know, we don't know each other that well. And, you know, you made a great choice. And I really think we're um, a going to inspire people with this podcast, B, going to inspire people at your Creative Zen Talk, and C, I mean, the future is very bright, uh, and I could only imagine, uh, you know, what we might be able to do to do together if we put our heads together. So um, I am I really appreciate your time, Eric, and um, anything else you want to share wrapping up here before we have people join us on Friday the 13th for Creative Zen? Yeah, I love what you just said. And I appreciate that. Um, you know, one of the things you just did was honoring somebody else. And that's, you know, that's one of our sacred seven. And so uh, I appreciate what you said. Um, I'm glad that it, that it had the impact that it had and hopefully we'll have on the, on the listeners as well. And I honor you for the stuff that you're doing. I mean, you got some great stuff coming up. And I would say, because the name of this is learning to choose, decision is a very, very powerful warrior trait. And I would say in wrapping up, decide and decide to decide. So you have opportunities that are coming your way. There may be risk. It may seem scary. It may push you out of your comfort zone. Make that decision because it will change everything else in your life. Well put. And if you need help making that decision, and I, I can't mention every event that we have going on. The Creative Zen's a great one, but... We are so glad to have recently brought back another free event, another great group, um, <clears throat> Axon Club, our goal-setting accountability mini mastermind group that we do for free bi-weekly uh, every other Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. It's uh, Action and Zen, Axon, A-X-E-N. You can find it on Eventbrite and Facebook events. And essentially, we uh, encourage people to come with a goal, idea, a startup, a passion project, or none of those things. And the first thing that we do is we give people a notebook and ask them to write down 150 life goals. Uh, I want to go to Europe. I want to make a million dollars. I want to you know, expand my business. I want to buy a piece of commercial real estate. I want to find future Mrs. Snow, whatever those goals might be. If you write down 150, you get a lap dance or burrito, and only two people have got that point. Um, but it's obviously, as you know, it's the 
exercise of putting the pen to paper and putting them down, uh, putting those goals on paper. And then the real magic happens where we break into uh, breakout groups and uh, you bring whichever goal is most present for you at that time, that week, that meeting to the breakout group. And we help people smart their goals, make them specific, measurable, action oriented, results driven with the time constraint. What can you do in the next two weeks between this meeting and next meeting to help you get closer to achieving your goal? And if you don't do those things, nobody is there pointing their finger at you saying, oh, you didn't achieve your goal. Uh, we have a Facebook group. It's very supportive. Some of my that we share the goals in, we share resources, we share TED Talks and motivation and positive things. Uh, if you have an event, you know, you literally just tap into 20 to 30 people that come to these meetings regularly who will show up to your event. It's been one of my favorite, most impactful things that I've ever been a part of uh, in our community. It's changed hundreds of lives, thousands of times over. I'm forever grateful that of all the people that I reach out to in Miami to bring their thing to Fort Lauderdale, Ivan Dynamo de Jesus, the founder and the creator of this Axon Club, uh, did make a choice and he did come up here every other Tuesday for many years um, before COVID to help us facilitate the group. And now my friend Eden Lasco um, co-facilitates and really runs the group with me at Art in Oakland Park uh, every other Tuesday. So there, there, there are free resources. There are masterminds. There are TED Talks. There are Creative Zen Talks. There are Bold Men Adventures. There are books. There are podcasts. There are so many things available in 2023 you just got to make that choice. You just got to step outside that comfort zone. And if you don't know how to make that choice, there are like-minded people in the community that might be further along on their path. They might be on the same level of your path. They might be even earlier on in, in the path than you are. And I am a firm believer that rising tides raise all ships. And that's how we're going to make this place where we live a better place to live and not just a better place to vacation here in beautiful Broward County, Florida, because we live here. Um, so I, I, I'm i just blown away. I'm floored. I'm, this is probably one of my most enjoyable episodes that we've recorded thus far. Um, all respect to my previous guests, who I also enjoyed having on the podcast. But um, Eric, I really appreciate it. I'll try to link all this great stuff in the show notes, at least your website and Bold Men Adventures and uh, some of the book recommendations. And I uh, hope you guys can choose to join us on Friday, October the 13th. The doors open at 8.30. The talk starts at 9. You will be out of there by 10 a.m. And if you need things to tell your boss of why it's okay for you to miss part of the morning of work, one Friday morning a month, we have a list of truthful things. You're gaining insight. You're gaining connections. You're gaining motivation. And it's not that you're going to leave your company like I did and become an entrepreneur, but maybe you can bring these insights back to your team. Maybe you can bring them back to your company. Maybe you can bring them back to your community. And you know nobody needs to sit at a desk you know, 40 hours a week. It's okay if you sit at that desk 30 and a half hours a week. Um, so if you need something to tell your boss, I got a great list I could send you. I'm sure Eric could come up with some good reasons as well of why it's okay. And, um, we look forward to having you join us. Appreciate you guys tuning in and listening this far. And, uh, Eric, I look forward to connecting with you more, uh, in the future here. Thanks, Evan. It was a pleasure being here. I really appreciate it. Likewise. You have a good rest of your day. Cheers.